Hello! Now with this class we're going to start the next phase of our look at PHP. And in many respects what we're going to be looking at has nothing to do with PHP at all. We're going to be looking at databases over the next few classes. And much of what we'll learn about databases is actually independent of the programming language that we might be using to interact with them. So a lot of this will apply even if you're looking at a different server-side language. Now in PHP we've already seen there's a couple of different ways to store things and um, store values that we can look for later. We saw that there was regular variables, there was form variables where you can keep sort of chaining them on and passing them on, and then session and cookie variables, which are very similar. And then the last place where we can store data is a database. And the database has a number of important features, but the main one is that stuff can be stored in a database pretty much indefinitely. So we can put something in there and then come back a week later, a month later, and it'll still be there. That's not an option that's available to us with any of the other uh, data stores. So we've already seen, if we go back to when we first looked at server-side programming and first looked at PHP, that um, the web server has HTML files that it's, it's serving up to the client. And there may also be PHP files stored on the server. And these programs um, run on the server and as the page is going out the door, pretty much the code is executed and the um, client or the browser just sees plain vanilla HTML. The client side has no knowledge of the PHP program that was running there in the background. It just sees regular web page. When we add a database to the mix, the database is um, f further towards the back end again. So the um, server, the PHP code or the web server, that's going to communicate with the database. It's going to get files, it's going to get information from there, um, or it's going to take our requests and add things to the database. But it sits between us and the database. It sits between the client, the browser, and the database. And so in this here, we kind of have the full range of things that would be going on in a website. So at the front end, we can have our HTML, we might have some CSS, there might be lots of JavaScript running in the browser on the client side. Then we have the um, web server and there would be the PHP there as well. And then behind that again, we would have the database. And so the PHP code sits between us and the database. If we want to actually work with a database and um, get things running ourselves and, and write some code, we actually need to launch the database in addition to the web server. And so inside an um, XAMPP, you can see that there. I'll show you that in my machine just so you can see how that would work. So here we have the manager and if we go to manage servers, you can see that there's nothing running at the moment. So as we've already seen, in order to have our PHP work at all, we do need to have the web server up and running. So that when we do localhost, blah, 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 we can actually see the um, pages as they would appear on a web server. Now, to work with a database, we also need to get the database server running. And so we start that. And so when we're working with PHP and databases, we need both of those up and running. OK, so there you have it. So nothing too, um, too difficult there. Now, so most programming languages actually provide some way of storing data permanently on the computer system. 
usually as files. So in C, for example, you can, there's all these commands you can use to open up a file on the hard disk and write values to it or open up a file and read values from them and stuff. Generally, though, um, that's relatively clumsy and, and complex, you know, and generally file systems that you have access to from um, programming languages are sequential. So, you know, you can read things in in order, the first thing, then the second thing, and the third thing. But to go to item number 79, you know, you have to read, you know, the first 78 to get to that even. So problems like that. And also it's just, it's not terribly sophisticated. So what databases do is they abstract out the data storage process for us and they take care of the details. And in particular, they take care of the details of how the thing is stored, how the thing is represented, you know, at the bit level. And importantly as well, um, they take care of doing all that efficiently and doing all of that quickly. And also then they have um, features that allow us to pull stuff out and then start insert fairly quickly. So, um, so they're like a specialized service or a specialized piece of software that's optimized for all of these, these problems. Um, so as such, a database provides like a service to the code that we're running. Now we can access a database from PHP, which is handy and that's what we're interested in. Now it turns out there's a whole bunch of different kinds of databases and there are all lots of new hip and trendy ones that, um, I don't know, come and go. I suppose they don't ever go, but um, the classic database then is a, is a relational database, it's called. And everything we learn about relational databases is actually going to be independent of PHP and will apply when we're accessing databases using other languages too. And the basics of this haven't actually changed since the 1960s. So this is the kind of the way we do things and they've been around a long time now and not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's nice to know that this is a set of skills and knowledge that isn't going to um, have a short shelf life. If it's been around since the 60s, there's probably another few decades to go on it. So in a relational database, now like I said, there are different kinds of databases. We're only interested in a relational database. So in a relational database, the database is organized into one or more tables of columns and rows. So our data is going to be in tables. And a unique key then is going to identify each row of a table. Rows are also called records or tuples. I'll probably just call them rows. Columns are also called attributes or even fields. I'll probably call them fields. And then um, each table or, yeah, each table then represents one entity type. So each table is for one kind of thing. So you might have like one for customers, a table for products, a table for orders. And then each row represents an instance of one of those things. It makes more sense when we when we look at an example. So here is a table of customers. And so we have like a member ID. So these are so the um, each row here. So like one, two, three, you know, each each of these rows represents a single customer. So John Smith, that's his phone number. His email address is js at gmail .com. So this table, what we can see of this table anyway, is four customers. So each row represents a customer and each column represents an attribute or a field, but a piece of information about that customer. So here, you know, the, um, in row number two there and um, column F name, this is telling us that the first name of customer number two is Anne. So if Anne Jones, that's her phone number, that's her email address. Now, one of the columns has a special job. One of the columns, well, typically one of the columns, there's an exception to that, but one of the columns must be a primary key. And so the primary key is a unique identifier for the row. 
So in this table, the member ID is the primary key and the member ID would be unique to each customer. So there will be no duplicates of that ever. So we might have lots of John Smiths. We might have lots of Fionn Murphys. But there will only be one customer number two. There will only be one customer 714. So that number will be unique and not duplicated. And that's what distinguishes each customer from the other. You could see why we would need this. I mean, in Ireland, you have lots of Mike Murphys, you know, for example. Um, increasingly, because telephone numbers and email addresses are also unique, you find actually that a lot of the time some database designers would use that as the primary key. But of course, um, you know, Ann Jones is entitled to log in and maybe change the email address she uses with this service. And there was a time when people changed phone numbers quite a lot. People tend not to change their phone numbers anymore. They kind of keep them for life now. So we see we see more of that. Okay, so that's the primary key. And we'll be talking a lot about primary keys. It's a very important um, feature. So that's something to, to bear in mind. So then this is a record. So this is like one person's record in the database. And we'll have as many records as there are people. Now, if we if we deleted Ann Jones from our database, we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't anyway, um, reuse number two. Do you know what I mean? It's not like if we delete two from here that Mike will change from three to two. Like, that's his ID. Okay. Um, so we, we generally don't reuse them, but certainly deleting one doesn't change the others. Okay. Now, a database then would have many tables with different pieces of information, and they would interact with each other then. Um, so here, if we have, like, say, a DVD rental type scenario, um, we could have the database of our customers here on the left. And then over here on the right, we have um, a database of our DVDs. So number one might be Titanic, number two might be Men in Black, three might be Star Wars, four be Central de Brazil, and five is Young Offenders. Okay. And then what we can do is we can connect up, um, we can have relations between um, tables by using the primary keys of one table in another table. So that's what this is saying here. So a, a database may comprise many tables, and then we can make connections between the tables by including the key from one table, um, you know, in, in a row. So this is called the foreign key. So what I mean here is that if we look here at the bottom right where we have a table for video rentals, this um, entry number two here, is saying that member three has rented video one. So in the customer database here on the left, we don't have a field where we say this person has rented Titanic. We don't put Titanic in there because Titanic is a, is a property of the, the video. It's not, it's not a property of the person. Um, and then we use this rental table here to make the connection between that person and that video. And so in this table here, the rentals table, member ID and video ID are foreign keys. So those are keys in this table, but they are primary keys from a different table. And they point us back to um, the information in those other tables. But in terms of storing the information efficiently and in terms of knowing what we need to know, pretty much all we need to know is that person rented that DVD. That's, this table is only making that connection. Now, if we want to know details about that person, we can go to the customer table. If we want to know details about the DVD, well, we can go to the video table.
But in terms of keeping track of who has rented what, that happens in the rentals table. And so that's the general idea then behind relational databases. We'll see much more of this in the coming classes. Now, when we are designing our database, we need um, to be very clear about what kind of information we are storing in each field. We need to very precisely specify the type of the information. And that's because one of the key jobs of a database is to store the information in a format that's very efficient. And so it needs to know um, basically how much space to reserve for the information that we're trying to store. So like if we're storing um, a value between 1 and 10, say, or we know we're going to store someone's age in years, so that might be like something from, you know, I don't know, 0 to 120 or something, that's going to have a very different internal representation in the database than, say, a value that could be anything from, you know, 1 to 20 billion and, you know, 15 decimal places. Like, storing those internally in the system will require different ways of representing the values, and some might be bigger or smaller. I mean, if we're going to, say, store um, a person's name in the database, or we're going to store a book in a database, well, clearly a person's name is going to be a lot shorter than a book. And we need to give the database as much information as we can about the kinds of things that we're going to be storing so that it can organize the structure in the most efficient um, way. So there are different types of data then that we'll be dealing with and we need to be familiar with those. And then when we are storing some information, we need to ask ourselves, you know, OK, what kind of what, what type should this be exactly? You'll recall that in PHP, I mentioned that it's very flexible about types. It doesn't even care sometimes if something is a string or if it's a number, you know, ash or whatever you're having yourself, we'll figure it all out. That's quite unusual. Um, many programming languages require you to be very specific upfront about the types of the data that you're storing. And databases are very much interested in the specific type of the data that you're storing, okay? So if we look here, for example, um, the first type here now that we could store would be an int. So this is an integer. So these are our whole numbers, and integers can be positive or negative. So like minus 2 is an integer. Minus 2.5 is not an integer. So if you are going to need to store values in your databases and they're going to be decimals, you know, you're going to have decimal points and not so many decimal places, whatever, well, then that's not going to be an integer. So you need to think about that. So if you were storing temperature, for example, well, I mean, is, is integer values, are integer values enough for you? Or, you know, do you need some um, decimal places? That's something you'd have to think about. Temperature could go either way, depending on what you're trying to do. So like 147 is an integer, 483 is an integer. Amazingly, the minimum value you can store is, how many million is that? Dum, dum. Uh, looks to me like, um, of course, it's a billion, depending on whether you're American or British. But anyway, 2,000, minus 2,000 million to plus 2,000 million. Okay. Whether that's a billion or not depends on, on where you live. Okay, and actually, if we, why these numbers seem so arbitrary is because um, this would actually be two to the power of n, so it'd be some some fixed number of bits, where um, n is probably a multiple of eight. So this is probably um, two. This probably requires, say, like four bytes to store or something like that. Okay. The reason it goes um, to minus blah 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 48 and to plus blah 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 47 
is you only need to you also need to slot for zero. Like between minus one and one, there's actually zero. There's one more in there, so we need a slot for that. So if your numbers are going to be smaller or bigger than this range, well then an integer won't do. But you can imagine for the vast bulk of the applications you would have, you know, those numbers, there's plenty of plenty of range there in those. So decimal then is another kind of number. And that's a floating point number, but it's a decimal number. And you can specify then the um, number of decimal places that you're going to use. Actually specify how big the number is going to be. So you would have to give a lot of thought to this um, before you decide on what's going to be in your database. So Argos, for example, could probably store the prices of its products with decimal 5, 2 because there's probably nothing in Argos more expensive than 999 euro 99 cent. I would hazard a guess. Maybe, maybe there's a big screen TV in there that's more than that. But certainly, um, you would probably get away with um, five comma two. So three decimal, three values. You know, zero minus minus nearly a thousand to nearly plus a thousand. Okay, there. And then two decimal places is enough, obviously, for uh, money. Now, if it's temperature, you might decide you only want one decimal place. Um, it would depend. Sometimes for money, you might want to store more than two decimal places if you're going to be calculating, you know, the interest on, you know, lots of different things and compounding it and blah, blah, blah. You might want greater precision. But you can decide, or not only can you decide, you must decide in advance what degree of precision you want. And then the database will organize and to store, organize enough space to store that then. So obviously if you want more precision, it's going to take up more space. Less precision, going to take up less space. Um, double is another type of number. And that's... Um, a floating point number, okay, which has um, double precision. So, floating point is a way of storing decimal numbers. There's a whole standard for that, and it's it's complicated enough. You could have a whole lecture now on floating point, actually, if you wanted. And in fact, some students who study computer architecture or computer systems would indeed sit through a whole lecture on on um, floating point system. But it's a way of representing decimal values inside in the computer system and you can have um, a number of bits used to store that number and you can also double the number of bits if you want lots of precision so depending on the application you will need more or less precision in your decimal um, your floating point representation one of the issues with floating point is that and the way it's stored internally, sometimes the uh, there's a tiny fraction is lost. So I've often seen in a program, for example, where you're expecting something to be one, but actually because it's stored as a floating point, it's actually like point nine 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 but not quite one and there are applications where that can cause a problem and others not so much i mean if you're if you're launching a rocket to mars you know a little bit out at the beginning can can mean an awful lot out by the time you enter the mars orbit um whereas you know for you know the temperature of your microwave i mean whatever so um, it can depend. You need to think about what degree of precision that you need. And then you need to tell the database what you've decided so that it can reserve enough space to store the values and store them efficiently. Next up then, we have a few ways of storing the time. So we have a date type, and that will store it in format a year, month, and day. We can also store the time which would be in hours, minutes, and seconds. And then another type is date time, where we have the day and the time of day combined. Okay. So, I mean, 
for a video rental store do you need to store the time that the person rented the movie or just the day that's a that's a question i mean in car hire terms you would pay for 24 hours if you know or in parking even um so depending on the application you may want just the date or you may want the date time or you might just want the time it would depend but you have to have a serious think about that and make a decision and then let the database know what your decision was. An interesting one is year. You can store a year as a type, but you can only store from 1901 to 2155. So I guess in 2155, people will be freaking out about the... Um, 2155 bug like the y2k bug all that old code all those old databases what were those people thinking 150 years ago um the reason it goes from 1901 to 2155 that sounds a bit arbitrary i guess it is arbitrary um but the reason that's that range is that that gives you only 256 possible values and you can represent 256 possible values in one byte or just eight bits. So if you have eight bits, you can go from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And in that binary representation, you can have 256 possible things. So that's why there's 256 of them. And I guess 1901 was as, as good a place to start as any. This is certainly preferable to using just two digits, um, which was the issue with the Y2K problem. Okay, So that's why there's that many. Now, car then is a string, okay? And that's a string of characters. We've seen strings in PHP. We, have, we can store strings in a database also. Interestingly, um, car is a fixed length string. So we say how many characters are going to be in the string. So if we say car 50, it'll be 50 characters long. Now, if we store, say, Colin in that fifth string of 50 characters, well, it's going to be C-O-L-I-N and then 45 spaces. So it's a fixed length string. Sometimes we might want that. More often, I think we would want a variable length string. So that's what a var car is. And that's a string where you specify the maximum length. Okay? So if I specify var car of 50 and I put colon in there, well, it'll just be C O L I N. <coughs> Excuse me. There'll be no padding. So that's probably more, more useful. With both car and var car, you do need to specify the maximum length that you're going to use. So if you specify you're going to use 50, well, then the database will only make enough space for 50. I mean, if you know it's going to be a short string, then there's no point in taking up the space required for a long string. That will be so inefficient. So that's why we're asked to specify what that would be. Now, obviously, you need to give yourself enough space. Um, you know, some people may have particularly long names, depending on where they're from. And you see this, that airlines, for example, have specified a maximum length. And if your name is longer than that, well, it just gets, you know, chopped off in the database. So you need to have a think about that, figure out exactly how many characters, or what the maximum number of characters you would need. And then maybe, you know, throw a little bit extra in for just to, for a bit of safety. In any event the maximum length you can have is 255 characters. And again, that's not a surprise to me. 255 is the maximum value you can represent with one byte or eight bits. So you can see some of these choices here are tied to the physical way in which the information will be stored in the system using bits. And so we see two to the power of n coming up a lot.
text is a string that's much longer than a varchar, and it's a string of up to 65,535 characters. Um, I will wager you that um, 2 to the power of something is 65,536. Not sure which end, could work it out, but it's a bit early in the morning for me for that. Um, a blob is a basically a big chunk of raw binary data. That could, you know, so in, in that scenario, you're pretty much saying, look, here's a chunk of bits, just store them for me. I'll figure out what they mean. I'll figure out what they're doing. So that could be some sort of weird format you're doing yourself or, or whatever. Okay. Um, two other useful ones are enum. So that's a single string from a predefined list. So we might decide, for example, that um, our list can have only in it pepperoni, Hawaiian, or margarita. And then an enum will store only one of those values. Now this is very useful because this is a kind of thing we would often have in a database where you're choosing from a set of predefined values. And to represent these internally in the database system as strings would be very inefficient because really, if you've got, say, eight different kinds of pizza, to store which kind of pizza a person has chosen would actually only require three bits. In three bits, you can store up to eight values. So we could be using three bits to store the pizza instead of, you know, lots and lots and lots of bytes to hold the name as a string. So when we specify an enum, we specify a list of things, the database management system is going to be very interested in how many there are. And if there's less than eight of them, it'll store them using three bits. If there's, <coughs> if there's four or under, it would only use two bits. So it can, knowing this in advance, it can store the information very efficiently and reserve only as much information as it needs. And that's why we have database systems. They do all this thinking and all this worrying for us. We just say, look, here's my stuff. Store that for me, buddy, um, as efficiently as possible. I just want it back really quickly when I ask you for it. You can look after the details. And so by specifying the type, we are really helping out the database in terms of um, storing those things efficiently. Set then is very like an enum. Again, we have a predefined number of things, but with a set, it can be one or more of those things. So in a pizza scenario, for example, um, we might have, you know, 10 possible toppings. You can have any one of them or not have it, but you can mix and match. You can have chicken, you can have onions, you can have jalapenos. So that might be a set. But again, knowing how many there are, will really help the database system store our choices very efficiently. So they're the, the most important types. Now, different database flavors will allow for, um, you know, more types. It's worth checking the documentation of the actual database that you're using. But they're mostly just variations of the ones we listed. Just by way of example, um, in the uh, MySQL database, there's some um, extra ones. So we've seen int, for example, and we saw that int went from minus 21,000 million to plus 21,000 million. And um, I speculated, it would be interesting now to go back and listen to the recording, I speculated that you could probably do that in four bytes. Did I say four? I'm not sure. I think I guessed right anyway. Um, you can have different size ones. So a tiny int, for example, will only take up one byte. And so with that, you can go from minus 128 to plus 127. Now you could see for someone's age, actually that would be sufficient, you know. Why take up four bytes when, you know, one would do the job? The chances of you having to store that someone has um, 
an age of greater than 127 are for the most part um, null. No, maybe, you know, in, in the future, you know, we'll have, oh, my God, the tiny int bug. You know, how do these people in 2015 think we would only live to 127 at most? You know, obviously, you know, life expectancy was increasing. But for now, anyway, I think, you know, if you're storing someone's age, tiny int, not a problem. There's a small int, which only takes two bytes. So that would take you from, um, basically, for that, you'd have 64,000. or I said 64, sorry. It's 65 and whatever. Um due to the power of n maths going on there. And a medium int um, gives you 16 million. If you look actually, um, do you ever notice in graphic systems you get 16 million colors? Well, it's 16,777,215 actually, because the colors in um, graphic systems are stored using three bytes. Okay, so depending on the application then depending on what information you're trying to store by making the right choice here you can vastly improve the efficiency of your database and the, the size you know if you're if you're using three bytes where one byte would do you know it's going to take up three times as much space that's not good so that's why we have all these different types and even um, flavors of the types so that we can specify as precisely as possible to the database what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be storing, and then it can store it as efficiently as possible. Now we can constrain the information stored in the fields even further. We can put constraints on it, and then the database management system will enforce those rules for us. So here are some of the very common modifiers, we call them. So the first modifier is not null. And that basically is saying this can't be empty. So when we put a record into the database, this value must be there. So you might decide, for example, for a customer database that the email address has to be provided. If it's not there, you're not, you're not having it. The database should reject the attempt to put that into the database. Now, as we've seen, you know, um, we can check the input from the user as well. We should probably never ask the database to put um, an entry into the um, customer table without the email address. We should be, as programmers, making sure that never happens. We never ask it to do that. But we can say um, in the database as well, look, if someone tries to do that, tell them no, they can't do that. Unique, and it's, unique is an important one, and this will insist that records cannot duplicate any entry. So basically, um, the email address must be unique, for example. So if you have a customer in the database and they provided an email address, you can insist that no other customer uses the same email address. Now, you could argue, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Why might we want to do that? But you, you can do that. Auto increment is one we're going to see, and this will automatically generate a number that's one more than the previous value for that column. Now this only works with um, numeric um, fields, numeric columns, and we see this actually for the primary key. So typically we will say the primary key is a number, it's an integer, and it's auto increment. So then when something gets put into the table, um, this will just be one more than the previous one. It just kind of saves us saying, okay, what's the highest value of the primary keys? Add one to that. Okay, that's going to be our primary key now for this new one. It just takes care of all that. Default is a very useful one. It allows us to specify a value to be used when a record is being inserted without it. So if someone was to attempt to add something to the database, and left one part blank for that particular customer, say, we can put a default in there rather than leaving it blank. And of course, the primary key then is a vital one. We have to specify that a certain um, column, a certain value is the primary key for that table. Every table must have a primary key and that primary key must be unique. Actually, if you say um, the primary key, if you specify something as the primary key, 
and then you also specify that must be unique you'll get an error because like duh you you can't say it's unique it's the primary key it has to be unique anyway that's just a, an aside there so these are the things we can um, specify No, we can communicate with the database management system using a structured query language, or SQL. And this is a special language that was designed for communicating with relational databases. And it's for building and managing and modifying relational databases and hasn't changed pretty much since the 1960s. It has been around for a long time. So it's worth investing some effort into learning SQL because any skills you develop in SQL will, will be useful for a long time. SQL has a very long shelf life. It certainly had one very long thus far, and it's expected to continue. Some people call it SQL instead of SQL. Um, I, I call it SQL, um, but maybe I'm not, a, I'm not a database head. I don't know. Don't want to get in one of those GIF versus GIF arguments. GIF, by the way. Um, anyway, so the SQL um, sits kind of between the server and the database. So when we're doing PHP, for example, we have our HTML and our data coming and going from the browser to the web server and the PHP as part of that. And then that can PHP can issue commands or queries to the PHP, to, to the SQL server. So the PHP can say, give me such and such a table, please, or insert these values into this table. If we do ask the um, SQL server, if we do ask the database for some information, it will come back as a table. So it sends back tables. They will actually arrive at PHP as kind of a big array. So from a programming point of view, the PHP will have an array. It can do what it wants with that. Maybe it can even put it into a HTML table and show it to us in HTML or whatever. But the PHP sits between the browser and the database. As a developer, it's also possible for you, when the database is running on your machine, to crank up a command line um, terminal and talk directly to the database using SQL. And you can do that. Um, it's different on Windows and Mac. Um, and in the, the textbook that you have, it talks. It does a lot of that. We're not going to do that so much because SQL um, is also accessible to us from the um, PHP MyAdmin in the um, XAMP that we're running. So we can go in there and we can issue. SQL commands from the admin there. So that's probably a more attractive way to do that rather than using a command line. We'll take a look at that in a second. In there, actually, we can also build our database with a sort of a, a more graphical interface. We can even modify the database, put stuff in and out. But it's important to know the SQL commands for doing that too. So we're, we're going to look at that. I'm going to just crank that up and show you just so you can have a quick look, but we won't do very much with that. So here the web server is running and the MySQL database is running. So now I can go localhost and I can say um, php myadmin. And this brings me into um, the place where the databases are. So I can actually have a look. So um, there's some I made. I just made a test one earlier, for example. There's no tables in it. Um, I made another one earlier. Nothing in that either. Okay, this is very informative. 
Um, here's another one I made, like extra vision. And we have here, we have two tables. We have a customer table. If I click on the customer table, I can see that in there. Now I can actually modify the table directly from this interface. And here's a DVD table. We can modify that too. So this is this is probably where a lot of people would go and hack away at their database and just modify things while they're developing it. We can also um, see this structure here. But, um, so we can see here that this table, the DVDs table, I've set up it has um, the primary key here. That's what that's telling us. That's the primary key. That's an integer. Um, and the auto increment is on there. The title is a var car, and it's up to 50 characters long. And then there's the year that the movie was released, and I have an enum here. We'll, we'll talk about these later, but you can see that. And then you can also here in the SQL part, you can type in SQL commands here and go run them and see the output of those, see the results of that. So that's kind of just a bit more convenient than cranking up a command line terminal and hacking away at it. Um, but all those ways are perfectly fine ways to interact with the database. This is just perhaps the, the prettiest.